it's as well to start a day which offers so serious and stimulating a prospect with a laugh. And if you want a full-blooded, raucous belly laugh, let me give you one. It's the thought of our leader, our Prime Minister, getting off the plane and staring with true and genuine commitment into the camera lens and speaking these words designed to ricochet around the country. Those who riot will face the full force of the law. And as we start a day of what I believe will be of enormous worth and importance on the state and position of judicial review in 2011, we might, uh, as we strive to suppress our laughter, reflect on why those words trigger so irreverent a response. Leave aside the banality of public speech today, those faint glimpses into the blindingly obvious. Uh, we can all recognise a windy banality when we hear it. Uh, you can apply uh, what I call uh, the contrary proposition test. Those who riot will not face the full force of the law. <laughs> It's not that that should meet with our laughter. No, it's the humbug and the hypocrisy of it. When government tells us that wrongdoers must face the full force of the law, we can surely be forgiven for wondering why that seems to have no application to government itself. To what extent does an overweening executive face the full force of the law. Yes, we congratulate ourselves, like all modest public lawyers, on the breadth and flexibility of modern judicial review. We wave the banners of the rule of law and impose standards against which we measure the executive action of central and local government. Each time some cheap jibe against an imagined or even acknowledged absurdity on the fringes of the Human Rights Act attracts the headlines, we respond with the suggestion that absent those standards, a higher and humane law imposes, would they not still be hooding detainees? Would they not still be sending all those who have spent their formative years being educated in, the, in this country back to somewhere they've never been before, whose language they cannot speak? Would we not be sending people to prisons for torture, provided that doesn't take place in our green and pleasant land? Oh dear, they're not very happy examples of the achievements of judicial review, and still less of successive governments facing the full force of the law. And in each case I've referred to, still going on, do they acknowledge the full force of the law even when they've lost? But before we overwhelm ourselves in a smug blanket of the righteousness of our cause, the cause of legal fetters on executive outrage, we should pause and reflect. Today presents a fine opportunity for such reflection. None of the achievements of you, the public lawyers, and of the courts would be possible if those oppressed by the failures of the executive to obey the law are deprived of access to the courts. The underlying importance of today lies, I believe, in its source. There are, of course, seminars at which CPD points can be acquired, even if they're not as distinguished, even where public law can be learnt and discussed. But none, I suspect, 
where the importance of obtaining and preserving access to the courts provides so telling a theme for today's discussions. The title under which the seminar was advertised was The Right to Know. But what can we do with that knowledge if there's no means of deploying it through legal action? And there are in seminars both this morning and this afternoon important discussions to be had about access to justice by NGOs and by those interventions of charities in public law and costs and legal aid funding. In times when the rich get richer and the idea of a market is no more than the rush of the Gadarene swine to the precipice and the poor are told to travel by pendulo further to obtain work. What we must fear, what we must constantly fear, is the divide, the alienation between those who have it all and those who have nothing and whose prospects are nothing. It is alienation which should make us tremble. It's surely self-evident, unarguable, but that the reduction of inequality but must be the most important objective of any democratic government. Inequality means unequal access to every resource of every sort. And here's Tony Jutt, whose ill fares the land should be required reading for all those who care, and even more for all those who do not. Unequal access to resources of every sort is the starting point of any truly progressive critique of the world. Inequality is not just a technical problem, it illustrates and exacerbates the loss of social cohesion. If we remain grotesquely unequal, we shall lose all sense of fraternity, and fraternity for all its fatuity as a political objective turns out to be the necessary condition of politics itself. Acting together for a common purpose is the source of enormous satisfaction in everything from amateur sports to professional armies. In this sense, we have always known that inequality is not just morally troubling, it is inefficient. Unequal access to the law is no exception. Inequality of access to the courts is morally troubling and inefficient. We love the theatre of the courts, brand new buildings opened yesterday, was it, where wives can ensure that their annual take is 13 million pounds and uh, not five million pounds a year. But it's not a great source of amusement to those who really do need an advocate, an independent advocate to advance their cause their wish for a roof over their heads, their benefits. Their wish is to have someone to fight on their side, someone to fight in their corner. How do they get access to justice? It's simply no good advancing the principles of legal curbs on overweening executive powers if there's no one to advance them. It's trite to observe that in times of war, the protection the law provides for against oppression is all the more important in support of the liberty which will otherwise suffer. But we don't speak loudly enough as to the dangers of financial hardship to the rule of law. Inequality of means obstructs equality of access. 
government, after all, seems to regard the law as a luxury, like a Gucci bag to be left behind in times of economic downturn. And, of course, to some it is. But not to those who the PLP try to assist. Not to the independent lawyers who fight unfashionable fights in tribunals and in the administrative court. Not for reward, but because the law demands it. We should never forget that in many of the greatest triumphs of public law, government has fought with vigour and ample resources to deny the rights the law has conferred on people. It's not government's fault. Democracy by focus group may be the inevitable consequence of a parliamentary electoral system every four or five years, or the X factor, or tweeting. And it's convenient for politicians to leave to the courts decisions about issues which excite bitter and rancorous dispute, though they'll never admit it. But when times are hard, access to the law becomes an easy target. Too easy if government pays so little heed to what the law demands. Organisations such as PLP provide those deprived, those whom inequality oppresses the most, some hope of advocating their cause. And it is troubling when the importance of access to an independent advocate and an independent court is undermined. And it is deeply troubling when it is undermined by a government which believes that the need for economy dictates economy of access to justice. That's how you get away with injustice. None of the sophistication and learning in the jurisprudence of which you will hear today means anything if the ability to use it is not protected. Justice becomes all too conveniently submerged in the cry that it's too expensive. Too expensive for what? Too expensive to face the full force of the law? Forgive my laughter, however hollow it must sound, and hurrah for the PLP.